Good morning, church. We welcome you as you join us this morning for a service of God's Word. We will be studying, continuing really our study in Deuteronomy and this morning in chapter 2. Deuteronomy is, we could say it's a, it's a look back, it's a summary that Moses gives of the 40 years of wanderings in the wilderness. And, uh, and we can, in a couple chapters really, in one book, we can, we can kind of go over the entire wanderings and the summary of it and, and learn a whole lot from what happened to Israel during that period of time and, and what we can learn from them. And so let's do that this morning as we begin in Deuteronomy chapter 2. Now, could you imagine living a life without purpose? I found a study that was done where 136,000 people were evaluated. At the age of 67, they were evaluated for a period of seven years. And... Um, as the years went by, they became older and some of them passed away from different uh, reasons and so forth. But that they found out and they, they really closely evaluated the thinking of these individuals. And they found out that people who had a high sense of purpose in life, their mortality rate was 20% lower. So it showed clearly that people with a sense of purpose, they were happier and they lived longer. It was Billy Sunday who said, more people fail through the lack of purpose than lack of talent. Thomas Carlyle was a historian, a British historian, in, back in late 1700s, early 1800s, and he was a believer, but he lost his faith during uh, his years in university at Edinburgh, and he said this, Ultimately, he said, a life without purpose is like a ship without a rudder. And maybe that was pretty much reflective of his life after he kind of turned back from his faith. A life without purpose is like a ship without a rudder. Now, if we apply that and look at the Israelites, they were in Egypt. They served the slaves. And can you imagine the excitement as finally Moses was raised up to deliver them out of slavery, out of Egypt. And they traveled out of Egypt, went through the Red Sea, and eventually they came to the cusp of the promised land. They were about to take possession, to step into the land that God had promised them, a land flowing with milk and honey. And they decided to send out 12 spies to spy out the land, and you know the story. Ten came back with a bad report. And because the people's hearts were already bent on complaining, they quickly grasped or held on to these ten complaining spies and they began to murmur. They began to complain. They said, you read and if we look at a previous chapter, Deuteronomy chapter 1, verse 27 says, Because the Lord hates us, he has bought us, brought us out of the land of Egypt to deliver us into the hands of the Amorites to destroy us. That's what they said. Moses, he tried his best to encourage them, but they would not hear him. And then God spoke. And they heard these tragic words that you read in verse 35 of chapter 1. It says, Surely not one of these men of, these, of this evil generation shall see the good land of which I swore to give to your fathers, except for Caleb and Joshua. The Israelites were now subject to wander in the desert for the next 38 years until all those who were 20 years and younger would have died. Could you imagine living in such a state? You get up in the morning and you have no reason to get up in the morning. It's just another day. And pretty much it's just, well, it's waiting for you to die. You're holding the other people back from not entering the land because you're still alive. Could you imagine getting married and starting a family and knowing that you're pretty much just in the way of the young generation? 
But that's how they lived for the next 38 years. It says in Deuteronomy uh, chapter 1, verse 46, it says, So you remain in Kadesh many days according to the days that you spent there. They had no reason to move. They just, just camped there and kind of maybe thought back on what could have been, but never was because of their attitude and their complaining. If 2.5 million people came out of Egypt, as is estimated, and 1.2 million needed to die, in the next 38 years, if you do the math, that means that they had to do 85 funerals a day. <laughs> so there was a lot of funerals for 38 years doing 85 funerals every single day. Well, it says they stayed in Kadesh many days and then God commanded them to move. In chapter 2, verse 1, it says, Then we turned and journeyed into the wilderness of the way of the Red Sea, as the Lord spoke to me. And we skirted Mount Zare for many days. Now, if you we have a map here, just for you to um, kind of stay abreast where we are. Again, they, they came out, if you, if you can see this pointer, um, up here on my left, they came out of Egypt through the Red Sea. They went down uh, through the wilderness to Mount Sinai, and they ultimately came to Kadesh Barnea, which is right here. And that is where they refused to enter the land. And then God, now in chapter 2, they begin to move again, and they come down uh, here and ultimately move up on the, well, it will ultimately be the east side of the Jordan River, but they, they come up here to Edom and ultimately up to where they cross the Jordan. But pretty much our entire chapter here, chapter 2 and 3, will be here on the east side moving up and they will be going through Edom where God will give them specific, specific instructions on how to uh, handle Edom, Esau, and the Moabites who live right here, um, and so forth. So this is the area where they will now be conquering some nations. So verse 2, it says, And the Lord spoke to me, saying, You have skirted this mountain long enough. Turn northward. So they were down in the bottom, and now they were going up on the north side. It says verse 4, And commanded the people, saying, You are about to pass through the territory of your brethren, the descendants of Esau, who live in Zair, and they will be afraid of you. Therefore, watch yourselves carefully. Do not meddle with them, for I will not give you any of their land, not so much as one footstep, because I have given it, Mount Zair, to Esau as a possession. You shall buy food from them with money that you may eat, and you shall also buy water from them with money that you may drink. For the Lord your God has blessed you in all the work of your hand, and he knows your trudging through the great wilderness. These 40 years, the Lord your God has been with you. You have lacked nothing. So the route now takes them through the territory of Esau, the Edomites. Now you know the story that they are related. Back, Isaac had two sons, Jacob and Esau. And the, and, and the Edomites are uh, the descendants of Esau. So they are really, they're, they're, they're cousins. And God told Moses not to confront them in battle. Now, if you look at number chapter 20, we see that Moses approached the Edomites. He tried a friendly approach. He tried to persuade them to allow them to go through their land, that they would not take anything that was not theirs, that if they needed something, they would buy it from them. But the Edomites refused. They, were, they came out to them uh, with with really ready for battle. And it says that the Israelites turned aside. If you look in Numbers 20, verse 21, it says, Thus Edom refused to give Israel passage through his ter territory, so Israel turned away from him. Israel was much larger. They could have dominated and conquered Edom because Edom was a weaker nation. But they didn't. They turned aside and thus avoiding conflict. You know, I think there's something that we can learn from that. Israel was wise 
in choosing a different route to avoid unprofitable conflict. See, sometimes we may try to avoid conflict because we're afraid or because we're cowards. And sometimes, by not avoiding conflict, we are cowardly. In other words, we need to choose our battle wisely. We need to choose to see, is it worth the fight? Is it worth? Is this the battle that God would have us to do? Is this a battle that we need to fight? Or should we just turn away and go around? It's easy to start a fight, but it's not so easy to quell a fight. Proverbs 26, verse 17 says, He who passes by and meddles in a quarrel not his own is like one who takes a dog by the ears. So if you, if you grab a dog by the ears, there will be a lot of noise. You might get bit, but it, it, doesn't really, it serves no purpose. It doesn't do any good. And so it is with a fight. There's, there's no sense in meddling with a quarrel that is not your quarrel. And so we need to be very careful with avoiding conflict. And here we see this would have been conflict within family, we could say. We see Adam and uh, Cain and Abel. There was conflict. We see with Jacob, his sons, Joseph and his brothers, there was conflict. We see even David. There was conflict with his father-in-law. Um, in, in the New Testament, we see uh, a conflict between uh, two sisters, uh, uh, two women, Phoebe and don't remember the other one's name, but, but conflict, it, you can start conflicts, but it's wise to avoid and to pass by and not to meddle with a quarrel that is unnecessary. And that is what, we, that is what Israel did here with Esau. Verse 8, it says, And when we had passed beyond our brethren, the descendants of Esau who dwelt in Zer, away from the road of, of the plain, away from Elot, and Isaiah, Geber, we turn and pass by the way of the wilderness of Moab. Then the Lord said to me, Do not harass Moab, nor contend with them in battle, for I will not give any of their land as a possession, because I have given Ar to the descendants of Lot as a possession. The Emim had dwelt there in times past, the people as great and numerous and as tall as the Anakim. They were also regarded as giants like the Anakim, but the Moabites called them Emim. The Horites formerly dwelt in Zer, but the descendants of Esau dispossessed them and destroyed them before them and dwelt in their place just as Israel did to the land of their possession which the Lord gave them. Now rise and cross over the valley of the Zered. So we crossed over the valley of the Zered, and the time we took to come to Kadesh Barnea until we crossed over the valley of the Zered was 38 years, until all the generation of the men of war was consumed from the midst of the camp, just as the Lord had sworn to them. For indeed, the hand of the Lord was against them, to destroy them from the midst of the camp until they were consumed. So now it's the second territory that they need to cross, which is the territory of the Moabites. And they too were distant relatives. Remember Lot and his daughters had children, and those were the Moabites. And he said, avoid conflict with them also. And so we see in these short verses here, we just kind of skim through it. It covers 38 years of wanderings for the Israelites. And we see here in verse 15, it's kind of a sad verse. It says, For indeed the hand of the Lord was against them, that is the old generation that was supposed to die, to destroy them from the midst of the camp until they were all, or until they were consumed. God was getting rid of this faithless generation so he could begin to work with the generation of faith. And you can imagine, they're just dying like flies, 85 a day on average. Maybe seemingly without reason, they just, they just died away. Making room for the new generation. You know, I think that's tragic. It's really tragic to think about that. To, to have such a life that it's kind of a life that's put on a shelf. And it's just there, but it's not really serving any purpose at all. 
And I think that we, even at this age, we need to work with our own selves and, and, and figure out what is our purpose in life, but even as we continue to age in life, how about when I'm 60 or 70 years old? Will I still have purpose? Will there be a reason for me to be alive? Or when I'm 80 or 85 years old, what is your purpose in life? Why are you existing? And I think it's important that we answer these questions even before we get there. We need to have a purpose and a reason to live, and we'll get that to that a little bit later. Now in verse 26, let's skip a couple verses. Go down to 26, it says, And I sent messengers from the wilderness of Kedemoth to Sihon, king of Heshbon, with words of peace, saying, Let me pass through your land, I will, strictly, I will keep strictly to the road, and I will turn neither to the right nor to the left. You shall sell me food for money that I may eat, and give me water for money that I may drink. Only let me pass through on foot. Just as the descendants of Esau who dwelt in Zair and the Moabites who dwelt in Ar did for me until I crossed the Jordan to the land which the Lord our God is giving us. But Sihon king of Heshbon would not let us pass through, for the Lord your God hardened his spirit and made his heart obstinate that he might deliver him into your hand as it is this day. And the Lord said to me, See, I have begun to give Sihon and his land over to you. Begin to possess it, that you may inherit the land. Then Sihon and all the people came out against us to fight at Jahaz, and the Lord our God delivered him over to us, so we defeated him, his sons, and all his people. We took all his cities at the time, and we utterly destroyed the men, women, and little ones of every city. We left none remaining. We took only the livestock as plunder for ourselves with the spoil of the cities which we took from Aror, which is on the bank of the river Arnon, and from the city that is in the ravine, as far as Gilead, there was not one city too strong for us. The Lord our God delivered all to us. Only you did not Go near the land of the people of Ammon, anywhere along the river Jeba, or to the cities of the mountains, or wherever the Lord or God had forbidden us. Then we turned and went up to the road to Bashan, and Ug, king of Bashan, came to us against us, he and all his people, to battle at Enrei. And the Lord said to me, Do not fear him, for I have delivered him and all his people into, and his land into your hand. You shall do to him as you did to Sihon, the king of, of the Amorites, who dwelt in Hashbon. So the Lord our God also delivered into our hands Og, king of Bashan, with all his people, and we attacked him until he had no survivors remaining. And we took all his cities at that time. There was not a city which we did not take from them, sixty cities, all the region of Argob, the kingdom of Og, in Bashan. All these cities were fortified with high walls, gates, and bars, besides a great many rural towns, and we utterly destroyed them, as we did to Sihon, king of Hashban, utterly destroying the men, women, and children of every city, but all the livestock and the spoil of the cities we took as booty for ourselves. So as Israel now travels up northward, it's a quite a populated area. And um, there's, there's, there's territories that they needed to cross. And one of them was Sihon, king of Heshbon. And the other one was Og, the king of Bashan. <clears throat> so remember, at this point, the old generation has passed away. And it is now the new generation with Joshua really heading up the, these battles. And they're beginning to wipe them out. It says here that they conquered both kings and their armies, Sihon, the king of Heshbon, and the king of Bashan, both of them, who lived, it says, in fortified cities. And in some cases, we see here that King Og was a giant. In verse 5, of chapter 3, it says, All these cities were fortified with high walls, gates, and bars, besides a great many rural towns. And we utterly destroyed them, as we did to Sihon, king of Heshbon, utterly destroying the men, women, and children in every city. Now, if you go down to verse 11, speaking there of, of King Og, it says, For only Og, king of Bashan, remained of the remnant of the giants, 
Indeed, his bedstead was an iron bedstead. Is it not in Rabbah of the people of Ammon? Nine cubits is its length, and four cubits its width, according to the standard cubit. Now, talk about a king-size bed. <laughs> this one was 13 and a half feet long. So it was, it was quite big. Some think it could have been his coffin because it was big because he was uh, wealthy. In those days, they put some of your wealth in the coffin, so it was big. Maybe that, maybe that was not that he was 13 and a half feet tall, but he was a giant. It says he was a giant. He was a big one, a big man, and uh, they conquered him. Remember the faithless generation there at Kadesh Barnea? They complained and they said, what did they say? The cities are fortified and the people are giants and make us feel like grasshoppers. And Moses says, you can do it. God has given the land to, to, to you. Just go and possess it. And they said, no, we can't do it. Well, now they have passed away. They've died. And now the new generation comes in. It's the same people. Giants. Fortified cities. Armies. But they just go in and they conquer them. Because it's a generation of faith. And they conquered the land just as God said that they would. God already gave it to them. They just needed to go in, fight, and possess it. Hebrews chapter 11, verse 6 says, But without faith, it is impossible to please him. For he who comes to God must believe that he is, and that he is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. Faith. Hebrews goes on to say that by faith, Noah prepared the ark. By faith, Abraham left his homeland. By faith, Sarah received strength to conceive. See, in our lives, maybe you have a fortification in your personal life that needs to be conquered. Maybe God is calling you to higher ground spiritually. But there are giants. There are fortified walls. <clears throat> but by faith, you can conquer and be victorious. You know, these, these walls, these giants in your life, oftentimes it can come in the form of habits. Maybe habits that have begin to take root in your life that are not good habits. And they become, they become a wall. They become a hindrance in your walk for the Lord. It can be temptations. Or it can just be weaknesses. It can be fears. Fear of stepping out in faith that is holding you back. Romans 8, 37 says, Yet in all these things we are more than conquerors through Christ who loves us. God is calling you to step out in faith. God is calling you to step out and to grow in your faith. And sometimes that will mean removing these obstacles that keep you from growing. And you know what they are. But God is calling you to faith, to step out and to believe that he can help you to overcome. See, if you look at the nation of Israel, they fought from victory. God had already promised that they would conquer the king of Sihon and the king of Og. They just needed to step out in faith, and they fought from victory. And so it is. God already has promised you that you are more than a conqueror in Christ. You are not fighting for victory. You are fighting from victory. You just need to step out in faith and do it. You know, conquering these two kings, you know what that did? It brought fear into the hearts of the Canaanites who lived on the other side of Jordan. When they heard what was going on and that they were conquering these powerful kings, their hearts became fearful. If you look at, uh, at Joshua chapter 2, and you look at verse 8, <clears throat> we see that later on when Joshua sends spies to Jericho, he sends two spies this time, not 12, two because, you know, there were two good ones the first time. He sent two spies, and they come to Rahab's house there in Jericho, 
and uh, she hides these spies. And then she comes out and she talks with them in Joshua chapter 2, verse 8. And this is what she says. It says, Now before they lay down, she, says, she came to them on the roof, and she said to the men, I know that the Lord has given you the land, that the terror of you has fallen on us, and that all the inhabitants of the land are faint-hearted because of you. For we have heard how the Lord dried up the water of the Red Sea for you when, for you when you came out of Egypt, and what you did to the two kings of the Amorites who were on the other side of the Jordan, Sihon and Og, whom you utterly destroyed. See, they looked at what was going on. 38 years, these guys were traveling around. They, they crossed the Red Sea, and they, they, they took note of that. And now they destroyed two of the powerful kings just on the other side of the Jordan. They took note of that. And they realized, you know, we can never stand up to these guys. And they were faint-hearted, even though they were strong, even though they had fortified walls, even though some of them were giants, but yet they became faint-hearted. God went ahead of them and really kind of did a battle for them. He brought fear into the hearts of the enemy so that when they got to the enemy, it was easy to conquer him. But they needed to step out in faith and accomplish and do the will of God. Chapter, uh, verse 12, it says, And this land which we possessed at the time from Aror, which is by the river of Arnon, and half the mountains of Gilead and its cities, I gave to the Reubenites and the Gadites. The rest of Gilead and all the Bashan, the kingdom of Og, I gave to half the tribe of Manasseh. All the region of Argob with all Bashan was called the land of the giants. So the land that is now being conquered on the east side of the Jordan is now distributed and given to two and a half tribes, the Reubenites and the Gadites, the tribe of God, and uh, half of the tribe of Manasseh. They choose to stay on the east side of Jordan because, because it was suitable for livestock, and they were herdsmen. So they loved the land, and, uh, and so Moses gives it to them, but with instruction that they are to, to go over and help the rest of Israel fight on the west side of the Jordan. And then once that is completed, they can, can come back and possess the land. Verse 18, it says, Then I commanded that you at that time, saying, The Lord your God has given you this land to possess. All you men of valor shall cross over, armed before your brethren, the children of Israel. But your wives and your little ones and your livestock shall stay in your cities which I have given you until the Lord has given rest to your brethren as to you and they also possess the land which the Lord your God has given them beyond the Jordan then each of you return to his possession which I have given you note in verse 20 is the word rest until the Lord has given rest to your brethren as to you He's saying, you guys have rest now. You have your land, you possessed it, but he's going to give rest to the rest of the tribes. The Lord really here describes rest as a, as, as a term um, or, or victory as a rest. He, he, he describes victory as a rest. You have had victory over King Sihon and King of Og. You have rest. And we find it frequently in the book of Joshua. As they conquer the land of Canaan, it describes it as rest. The victories are described as rest. <clears throat> now, if you look at Kadesh Barnea, and God said, okay, go in and possess the land, God desired to give them rest. And they said, no, what we will do is we will go back to Egypt. But there's no rest going back to Egypt. Now, if you look at the book of Hebrews, who, who kind of expands on this whole idea of rest, he's writing to the recipients of, of Hebrews, and he says to them, don't go back to the Jewish law and the Jewish religion, the, the Jewish faith of the Old Testament, because it can bring no rest. Rest is only found in Jesus Christ. And so it is for us today. If you want to find rest, true rest, it can only be found in a relationship 
with Jesus Christ. There's nothing else that can satisfy and that can bring true rest. You know, if you think about the word rest, it sounds so, so inviting. You know, this world, is, there's, there's, there's so much stress and so much uh, just, I mean, if you look at the world, it's depressing, really. But then you look at Jesus Christ and you can come to him and you can find purpose in life and you can find rest. It's so inviting. But it's only found in the person and in the finished work of Jesus Christ. Verse 21 it says, um, and I commanded Joshua at that time, saying, Your eyes have seen all the, that the Lord your God has done to those two kings, to these two kings, so will the Lord do to all the kingdoms through which you pass. You must not fear them, for the Lord your God himself fights for you. See, Moses is now beginning to groom Joshua as the next leader. And he commands Joshua to not fear. Do not fear as you conquer the land. See, fear has a crippling effect on us. It keeps a person from moving forward and, and, and conquering really what God has for you. Oh, I, I don't think I can do that because I fear what will people say. I don't think I can do that because, and there's, there's all kinds of fears. Maybe it won't work. Maybe I'll make a fool of myself and I don't want to step out. But Moses says, do not fear. Just step out in faith. Do it. And watch God work. If you look at, um, at Paul preaching in Corinth, it says in Acts chapter 18, verse 9, it says that the Lord appeared to him at night, and he said to him, Do not be afraid, but speak, and do not be silent. For I am with you, and no one will attack you to hurt you, for I have many people in this city. Even Paul feared. He was afraid in Corinth afraid of his life, afraid of what might happen. And Jesus came to him and says, don't be afraid. Just step out, move forward, step in faith, and watch me work. And I think that's God's word for you today. Don't be afraid. Keep your eyes on Jesus Christ. And when you do, God will work it out for you. He will walk ahead of you, and he will, he will really do the work for you. And you just kind of walk behind, and you can just, as you step out in faith, you just, kind of, you just kind of take it in, what God has already done. It's incredible how God works. Um, verse 23, it says, Then I pleaded with the Lord at that time, saying, O Lord God, you have begun to show your servant your greatness and your mighty hand, for what God is there in heaven or on earth who can do anything like your works and your mighty deeds. I pray, let me cross over and see the good land beyond the Jordan, those pleasant mountains of Lebanon. See, there was one thing overshadowing this celebration of entering the promised land, and that is that Moses is not allowed to enter. And now as Moses is seeing all these great works, he's beginning to see all this, these, these victories and the conquering of the land, and he's beginning to see God work in their midst. He gets so excited. He says, God, I just want to go over and just see you continue to work. But God says, you cannot enter. And the reason is because if you look in Exodus chapter 17 and verse 6, Moses was commanded to strike the rock to bring water out of the rock and to give water to the nation. And he was obedient. He did that. He he went and he struck the rock. The rock split, probably, and water just came right out of the rock. But then in Numbers 20, verse 7, the people were once again out of water. And they were all just complaining and blaming Moses. And Moses did the right thing. He went to God. What are we going to do with this problem? And God says, go and speak to the rock. And Moses, he was frustrated with the people and all complaining and it was a weak moment probably for him and he went to the rock and he took his rod and he hit that rock and he said here now you rebels must we bring water for you out of this rock well the rock brought water but but he misrepresented God 
he portrayed God as angry when God truly wasn't angry. The other thing that he did is he broke the picture of Christ's crucifixion. Now, if you look at 1 Corinthians chapter 10 and verse 4, we see that Christ is this rock. It says, And all drank the same spiritual drink, for they drank of that spiritual rock that followed them. And the rock was Christ. See, the Bible says that Jesus needed to be struck only once for our sins. But Hebrews 9, 28 says, So Christ was offered once to bear the sins of many. But we see that Moses kind of, he broke that, that picture by, by striking twice. And Christ did not need to be struck twice. And because of that, God said to Moses, you're not allowed to enter the promised land. Verse 26, and we'll close. It says, uh, But the Lord was angry with me on your account and would not listen to me. So the Lord said to me, Enough of that. Speak no more to me of this matter. Go up to the top of, of Pisgah and lift your eyes toward the west and north and south and east and behold it with your eyes, for you shall not cross over this Jordan. But command Joshua and encourage him and strengthen him for he shall go over before his people, and he shall cause them to inherit the land which you will see. So we stayed in the valley opposite Bath Peor. So God says, all right, Moses, what you can do is you can look at the land. Just go up Mount Nebo or Mount Pisgah, as described here, and you can look over the land. Now, on a very clear day, especially during winter when it's clear there, <clears throat> you can look all the way north to Mount Hermon. You can see... Um, the Mediterranean, you can see the Dead Sea, you can see Bethlehem, you can see a good part of the land from a distance. Um, and God says, you can do that. And, uh, and then he said, but then go ahead and continue to invest time in Joshua. Use your remaining days to mentor him and prepare him for what is to come. And I believe that that is one of the things that we are to do at all times. I mean, the Bible tells us in Matthew chapter 28, verse 19, it says, God therefore, go therefore and make disciples of all nations, teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded you. This is something that God has commanded each believer. Now, you have been born for a reason, for a purpose, and that is to bring glory and honor to the Lord. Now, how do you do that? Well, you say by worshiping him, right? Yeah, that's true. But worship is not just on a Sunday morning. It is our life. It is our walk. And the Bible says that we know that we love him if we obey his commandments. And one of the commandments that God has given us is that we are to go and make disciples. We are to disciple. We are to instruct other people to observe and to obey the teachings that God has written in, his, in, in, in the Bible. And that is something that we are to go through, do throughout our life. But I think especially as we get older in life, maybe you are not as busy physically with a lot of work. You have more time on your hand to raise up others and to instruct them and to encourage them in the things of the Lord. That's what Joshua is doing. He's raising, uh, rather Moses is doing, he's raising up Joshua to take the torch and to come up after him. And I think that is, that, is, that is something that you and I as believers, that gives us purpose. That's a reason. That's why you're here. We're not called to walk aimlessly. But we're called to be obedient to the Great Commission. And I pray that all of us will take note of that. And ask ourselves, hey, am I doing that? Am I discipling someone? Am I making a difference? Am I obedient to God's word? Let's pray. Father, we thank you again for your word and we can learn from it. And uh, we just pray, Lord, that you would help us to, to step out of faith 
Just pray, Lord, that as we just think about today's message and today's word, we see the consequences of not stepping out in faith. And then we see the consequences of stepping out in faith. We see the new generation, how they conquered king after king. And they possessed. And I pray, Lord, for each one listening in this morning, I just pray, Lord, that you would help us to be people that are people of faith, that are willing to take risks for Christ. When you call us out, that we are willing to go. That fear would not push us back. We see here that Moses encourages Joshua and he uses the word fear. Do not fear. And fear is something that can hinder us and really destroy God's work in a person's life. Help us not to be given to fear but to faith. In Jesus' name.